everybody. Welcome. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Chris Earls. I'm a co-organizer of the uh, symposium this, this year. Uh, my uh, partner in crime does not seem to be here, so I will definitely do the introduction. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Alexandra Bayen, who's, a, who's the, uh, the, the Acho Professor of, of Engineering at UC Berkeley. He's also a Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering and Civil and Environmental Engineering. At Berkeley, he's currently the director of the Institute of Transportation Studies. He's also a faculty scientist in mechanical engineering at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And Alex received his uh, degree in engineering, um, which is an applied math degree from Ecole Polytechnique in France, and his MS and PhD degrees in aeronautics and astronautics from Stanford. And he has many, many papers and many wonderful awards, including the Career Award and the PCASE Award. And so it's really my pleasure to introduce him now and have him be our taking off speaker for the colloquium this year. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, and I was just joking about you know, what's amazing about my schedule is it starts at 8 in the morning. It, it ends at 8 in the uh, evening. There's um, no single break. And I, 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 as soon as I'm back in Berkeley, I'm going to go back to the faculty and say that's exactly the way we should be running the seminars <laughs> on campus. Uh, so, um, today I'm going to talk about distributed learning dynamics and convergence in modeling games. Uh, so, mostly um, uh, a talk about repeated games, but in the context of uh, transportation engineering. What, what I wanted to do first is uh, give a brief overview of traffic monitoring and traffic information, because I think it's really got us where we are today. Um, and it's really uh, something which has radically changed uh, the field of transportation over the last decade. So if one thinks about historical, um, historically what the departments of transportation have been doing over the last half century, is basically thinking that they own the entire infrastructure, deploy it themselves, collect the data themselves, operate it themselves, and then basically distribute it. Uh, so whether these are loop detectors or their next generation wireless versions, whether these are fast track that they put, or easy pass that they put in the uh, cars or cameras, the original thinking was really, okay, we're the government, we do it all. And if you look at the um, uh, curve of devices um, over the last decades, this nearly vertical line is basically the rise of the Android uh, fleet in the world. Um, and this completely radically changed the field of traffic information in the last 10 years. And that's the beginning of the story that got us where we are today. When the project, Mobile Millennium, which was one of the early projects that in this field started, um, it was right around the time of the iPhone 1 launch. The iPhone 1, as you remember, did not have a GPS, and it was way before the Android ever existed. Um, and that means that um, what, what happened over the last couple of years was um, a, a, an enormous and rapid growth of the data available for traffic, which has um, initiated something which is irreversible with mobility and will continue impact, uh, impacting the field for the many years to come. So the, the, the outline of the talk today would be first to talk a little bit about this Mobile Millennium project, which was one of the early instantiations of this uh, crowdsourcing paradigm that is completely common today, um, leading to the meat of the talk here, which is, well, what does it do to mobility? What does it do to the way people learn how the dynamics of the system evolves, and how does that affect um, mobility as a whole? Uh, so Mobile Millennium was an early instantiation of this paradigm at the time. It was a consortium led by NSF, USDOT, Caltrans, and several of the major partners in the field, Nokia being the giant of the time. Um, and completely, I don't even know if anybody remembers Nokia phones uh, nowadays. <laughs> But, uh, and this probably looks like a vintage instrument, uh, good for the museum uh, technology. But the, the, the truth is, um, back in the day, what was really uh, exciting to us is that uh, we saw the first way to transform this, which is, uh, it looks like a vintage website, except it's still live, um, uh, to, into this, which you all have on your phone, and is mostly populated by smartphone data. Um, now, in 2008, the notion that this could be constructed from phone data was not obvious, even though everybody believed in it. What was unclear is the penetration rate of phones needed to make it reliable. And so if you think about it, I'm sure that many of you have once in your life used Google and been late to a meeting because they told you you'd be there in 35 minutes and interview you two hours. Um, that's common, that's a common story. And so the grail at the time was really to try to figure out, um, can we make an assessment of the penetration rate needed of users to make this work. 
not just because it was interesting, interesting to industry, but because the departments of transportation ultimately realized they wanted to buy that data, and they did not know, you know when would be the right time to invest and what would there need to be um, uh, in terms of data to meet their needs. And so the only way to demonstrate it at the time was to do an experiment, uh, because I think we needed more than just um, evidence and simulation. And so we, when we started this program uh, back in 2008 or 2007, what we very quickly decided to do is to run an experiment in which we would basically hire 200 students to uh, drive 100 cars for 10 hours back and forth on these 10 kilometers of freeways. I know that sounds ridiculous. Um, each of them carrying a phone that would transmit GPS data so we could gather enough data and evidence uh, to demonstrate it to uh, the public agencies funding this work, uh, to the NSF. Um, the notion was that with back of the envelope computation, we estimated at the time that the penetration rate we would get with that kind of crowd circulating back and forth would be on the order of 2 to 5%, which was a good forecast of what the fleet of smartphones would be 18 months from the launch. Back in 2008, people were forecasting a 2 to 3 to 5% uh, population um, penetration of smartphones in California, so people wanted to know, you know what can we do within two years. Um, being trained in the military, I was really excited about mounting this operation because putting 200 students in the field for just one day um, is quite uh, difficult. Hiring two, 200 students for just one day at uh, Berkeley is just impossible bureaucratically, so just that was actually harder than running the experiment. Uh, but it was really fun because for one day we um, basically uh, run a 12-hour operation. I had a former colonel from the Egyptian army run a common center to make sure that nobody escapes with a... One guy left with a phone and a car in the middle of the experiment. And of course, he didn't realize we had a GPS track of him. So he said, oh, right. no, 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 you're at this coffee and please get back on the freeway. Um, and in, in, we also had a bunch of people on the bridges filming the whole thing with high resolution cameras. Um, like this, so that we would have a completely alternate sources of data to corroborate the numerical results we were getting by basically just re-identifying the license plates on the freeway. So if you could have students on all the bridges um, and they all film um, and, and extract later on um, the, all the um, uh, license plates manually, it was an early instantiation of Mechanical Turk, okay? Uh, they didn't really like that part of the work. Um, and uh, that, that was a really good way to, 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 get, to get really two different sets of data. Um, one of the students uh, almost got arrested by the police um, one day because it was a rainy morning. He was trying five or six different cameras because he wanted to make sure they work in the sun, they work in every possible condition. He was, you know, he had a hood on, so um, a police officer comes in really angry after 10 minutes saying, we got dozens of call uh, from people saying there's terrorist actions on the bridge. Uh, what the hell are you doing? And so then he showed them a letter from uh, an agency saying it's actually legit research. And the police officer was very angry, but left the experiment and said, well, please, next time uh, when you do this, can you wear an orange vest and a helmet so then you don't get these calls? <laughs> which he did. And then there was no more calls. Because if you want to anything fishy on a bridge, if you wear the right equipment, nobody will give you trouble. Um, so we run that experiment. Um, this is uh, what it was. We had a press conference with the CTO of Nokia, Bob Iannucci, and the deputy director of Daltrans. Uh, Randy Wazeki at the time. This is a replay of uh, the GPS tracks of the vehicles on that day. Um, and we basically broadcasted that information live um, to uh, the press and to the journalists that were there. And this is probably the first time in the history of traffic that we had live information on the screen collected only from phones, broadcasting it live. And of course, it was only live for 10 hours because it was an experiment. Uh, but it worked quite well um, until around 11 a.m. This is roughly where we were on the map. Um, and then we saw this big patch of red, which we assumed was an accident. But because people could look at the freeway and didn't really believe that there would be so much of traffic right up front, about a mile north of where we were, they started questioning us in front of the press. Uh, and so then my heartbeat started to go faster and faster as soon as the algorithm had diverged. And basically, uh, this was the end of my tenure. Uh, that person. Um, used to work at traffic.com. What you see her doing on the picture is she's actually calling the headquarters of traffic.com, another defunct company in the field, um, and uh, basically checking on the traffic. And it turns out that it was a five-car pilot accident, and it ended up, um, we ended up seeing it about five minutes earlier than the police, which at the time had pagers, 
another defunct technology. <laughs> um, uh, but they used to get a text uh, every time there's an accident on that freeway. So of course, then that completely flipped the thing with the press because the people were really excited about it <laughs> and saw that uh, you know that, that things are um, works really well. So then. Then the rumor was born that uh, Berkeley created the accident on purpose to <laughs> demonstrate the technology, and I think that rumor came from Stanford. <laughs> so, uh, we built several uh, instantiations of that system, um, which we initially had called Mongo Millennium. Um, this is the generic architecture in its first generation, so a bunch of feeds um, going into filters that were uh, then fed to models, so using any kind of inverse bundling technique we would use. At the time, we were using mostly uh, ensemble Kaplan filtering on the discretized PDEs, um, uh, first order hyperbolic, so simple uh, traffic models that we used to produce the estimates and, and ultimately uh, send that information back to the, um, uh, to the different partners in the program. Um, this is uh, a, about a percent, well, half a percent of the data we were collecting. That one we were able to show uh, because it was just from taxis, so it was the issue with privacy. Uh, the others were a bit more tricky to show, um, but this roughly gives you a sense of what half a percent of the data would look like uh, for that system at the time. Um, and it's pretty amazing, just in the case of San Francisco, you can see after playing this for enough time, so about a day, you can practically draw the whole map. Now, just to give you a sense of scale, this is nearly eight years ago now. Um, Today, probably at a given time, Uber has about 2,000 vehicles in the city of San Francisco. And today, um, you know, Google's Android are probably more than 50 penetration percent of the penetration rate of the market. If you add this with any Google app running on any non-Google phone, uh, that means that uh, the amount of data available for that kind of work today is probably 100 or 1,000 or even more uh, than what we have here. So the, the point is, um, uh, it was extremely important to do this early on because this enabled the development of a lot of technology. A lot of these companies have hired our students. Um, but nowadays, the, the game has completely changed, and, and I'll talk a little bit about it uh, later in the talk. So, um, playing the movie long enough, that's, unless, that's basically what you get. So, it's, it's quite amazing the granularity of the data. Just in terms of the taxis of San Francisco, it's quite cool to see how far they go. Um, and you can imagine if you were sitting behind uh, Apple or Google or Waze or Enrix or uh, Uber's uh, computer, how much data you would have access to um, uh, for this work. Now, this uh, is roughly what 2% uh, penetration rate looks like in the form of a time-space diagram. Um, so time-space diagram is the bread and butter of every transportation engineer. It shows uh, the post mile on the freeway as a uh, function of the time. And then the color indicates, for each point is one GPS point, and the color indicates the speed. Um, you can see the accident happening in the morning, uh, more or less recovering, and then congestion of the afternoon. Um, and this is for 2% of traffic. Um, so part of the game then was to understand what kind of um, uh, reconstruction of traffic could you do? You can imagine if you're Google now and you have 60% of traffic, it's not even clear you need inverse modeling anymore. I mean, you might just need a smoother and, and that's enough. But it wasn't clear then. And so type of the work we were doing is trying to understand if we were adding privacy preserving computational architectures uh, to basically decimate 99% of that data except at very specific locations using a framework called virtual trip lines that was since patented by Nokia, then would that be enough to reconstruct traffic? And so part of the inverse modeling work we were doing at the time with ensemble camera and filtering was doing exactly that, which is essentially reconstructing what the PDE would have predicted had that data, or if that data was uh, injected in the PDE, uh, for example, with ensemble camera and filtering. And so the end of the story was really, um, you know, at the, we, uh, very quickly, obviously, um, uh, it's like uh, surfing, a, uh, surfing a wave and then there's a tsunami coming behind you called the private sector. Uh, very quickly, um, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, Google's team grew enormously. Um, any other company in the field hired in that field, many of our students, in fact, um, one of the people running traffic at Apple is a, one of the lead students in that project. Um, but right before this happened, in essence, you know, in the very last experiments we did, we were racing our system against Google, and this is back in 2010. Uh, at that time, we were able to produce, before Google developed their, their system really quickly, we were able to produce results about 15 minutes earlier than they were, just by basically uh, running these models. This is an example of a traffic accident happening in the Bay Bridge. Each frame is about 
30 seconds, and you can see on the Google frame, uh, it's, 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 it's way behind our, um, uh, ours, and also the resolution was much lower. And of course, nowadays, uh, again, the game is completely changed, so in a sense, this is the early ages of this. So to kind of wrap up that kind of historical uh, uh, part of the talk, um, this is roughly the timeline of how we interacted with the different companies. It's ironic that between the start of the project, this was the gigantic player, and uh, four years later, when everybody m managed to make it work, they were nearly defunct. Um, but um, uh, in the meantime, I think this has completely migrated to the private sector, and it's fair to say um, that um, nowadays, um, in a sense, it has become a free commodity that is not really revenue generating, uh, but is a negative if you don't have it as part of your mobile products, and that's why companies are investing so much money in making it work, but it still is not working great. And if, in fact, if you look at the detail of the distributions of travel time that are produced by any of these apps, and not to pick on one in particular, I mean, there's still a lot of improvement um, to, to, be, to be made to the algorithms that are currently used. Um, and a lot of these groups are still working very actively inside the companies. We work with them um, sometimes, and it's, it's, it, it's far from being finished. But I think it's fair to say that it's now in the hands of the private sector. And if you just correlate that with uh, the, the rise of the number of smartphones um, over the US population, uh, it's pretty much in the mature field. Um, so there was still a little bit of work to be done on the, on the government side. Um, and in fact, in 2010, um, California started to be ready to buy this data. And if you think about populating a traffic information system, um, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an important thing to do. So we wrote the first uh, RFP on behalf of the state of California to do uh, data procurement. Um, and you know, the type of contributions that they were interested in at the time is understanding those, the features of the data and how to price the data. So for example, if you buy GPS data, um, you know, should you buy it by the kilo or by the pound, and how do you, how do you price one pound of GPS uh, data, and how, what, what defines a good pound of GPS data? Mm -hmm. Like you go to the market, you know how to recognize the good tomatoes from the bad tomatoes. Um, well, with GPS data, it's kind of the same. For example, if you want to use it for traffic operations, it should not be more than five minutes old, because otherwise it's rotten. Um, and uh, if someone tells you that they're going to sell you one ton, or so say one million uh, points of GPS data a day, while well, you should question whether you're going to get all this data at night because they're a trucking company, when you actually need it during the day when the volumes are low. So there are all these metrics that we have to put in place to show that you know, if some metrics were, were um, met, they could provide valuable information and then what should be the pricing from it. And so um, this was the early emergence of the market uh, which today has not matured because I think that the main issue is that there's two main providers of search data, Google and Apple, and right now they're not selling. And then there's a lot of very small providers of search data that are selling to aggregators, but that's a kind of a very strange market. So things are going to change with companies like Sidewalk Labs probably, but at this point this market is kind of in standby until someone starts to sell. Um, this is when we this is basically when we jumped out of that train. Um, and, but I think wrapping up what we did over the years on this topic, which led to where we are today, is essentially a lot of modeling contributions because it turned out that these low penetration rates using hyperbolic first order scalar PDEs was a really good approach for modeling the, um, is the, the traffic on the freeways. It captured everything we wanted. The shock waves we were able to capture, the expansion waves we were able to capture, and that's pretty much all you need in terms of travel time predictions. Um, it enabled us to do a lot of estimation work, which was essential too, because the data is extremely noisy. Um, full fun experiments and some policy work. Um, so now, where does that leave us? Um, well, in a sense, one can say estimation is solved. Um, either you buy it from Inrix or either you have it as a company. Um, one could think, okay, um, control is interesting. So um, there was uh, this morning's talk, and so the notion being, well, if you were able to control inflows on freeways, could you generate arbitrary patterns of traffic? And that's something that one is trying to do. Um, and that is one thing that we're interested in uh, that ties into today's topic. Um, everything I've talked about so far is basically this yellow box in this diagram here, and that's how you run estimation. So you're fusing data, whatever you have, and that gives you nowcast. Um, current situation. Um, in decision support systems such as the one are being currently built by the departments of transportation, in essence what you do is you have a forecast of demand and then based on that you have a forecast of the traffic state which is essentially running a forward model in which you initialize 
the model with this, you feed it with that, and that predicts the system forecast. And the understanding of how um, this work in practice essentially relies on what controls points you have. So in the current projects we're working on with uh, LA Basin, LA Metro, and the District 7 of Caltrans is understanding how we're going to control all the traffic lights on a given corridor. This is the I-210 corridor in California. Uh, every red dot here is a point potentially we could control. Um, and so that includes the mirrors on the freeways, but that also includes the traffic on the parallel uh, arterials here. And so the notion of integrating all of this infrastructure across about 20 miles of freeway, um, and, and including uh, five major arterials, uh, is not a trivial task, because now you have to have models which are way more accurate than what you use for estimation, and that's a far from being a trivial problem. Um, and so part of the work that we'll be doing is essentially assembling all of these infrastructure systems into a single decision support system and write the proper algorithms to do the forecast and the control. But there's one thing which is probably changing faster than the technology, and that's the demand. And that's what I want to talk for the major part of this, the rest of this presentation. In a sense, Mobile Millennium was an early instantiation of, um, of traffic monitoring. Uh, there's a lot of groups like ours that work on traffic control in the classical sense of the term, which is essentially how you use the infrastructure to control the flows. Um, but there's a, there's a fundamental thing which is changing, which is the way people run themselves. And that is changing really fast. <coughs> Mostly because people finally have access to this information. If you were using something like Waze, or like Google, or like any of the early routers in 2008 or 9, you were completely ahead of your time. First, you had a smartphone. Second, you had figured out the right app. And, and third, you knew how to use it. OK, and, that's, and, and in 2009, there was probably a 0.01% of the population that was doing it. Nowadays, everybody has this for free on their smartphone. Um, and if you look at the number of people of you, who are using it, um, it's enough people using it that it's actually changing traffic. So traffic information has started changing traffic. This started happening three or four years ago in a very consequent manner. And now people learn, companies learn, algorithms learn, and um, we don't know what that will do to traffic, and we don't know how any of the classical control, like the one I just showed before with the classical infrastructure, um, will be able to meet these limits. And that's the problem that we're interested in working on now with the, the public agencies. And so the next thing I'd like to do over the next uh, five to 10 minutes is try to come up with a model of this, a very simplistic model that gives an analysis framework for it, um, and then try to see what theoretical conclusions can be taken from that model. And then based on that, we can think about what could be done, but this is just the beginning. Um, in a sense, one could look at this as the government is losing control over mobility. Mobility is being taken over by the private sector in a way that is becoming harder and harder to model. So what transportation planners do when they model demand um, is typically they will look at origin destination matrices, which are um, uh, nowadays collected with very prehistoric methods, mostly census data. Um, and based on that, they're going to compute dynamic traffic assignment solutions, or user equilibrium solutions in a static manner, um, which essentially uh, amounts to understanding how traffic will allocate itself um, in the network based on the notion that people will naturally evolve towards a Nash equilibrium. Uh, in, that means basically in the context of routing that everybody more or less gets the same travel time, and there's no incentive to deviate. Um, there's a lot of debate whether these are good models or not. There's a lot of uh, uh, concerns about that data, but that's essentially what people are doing. So um, um, one way to model the way people react to that information um, uh, can be posed as follows. The notion being that mobility is going to be controlled from wherever you live to wherever you work by whatever you're using to get there. So if you're using app, an app like Waze, you're going to follow their guidance. If you have an automated vehicle, then that vehicle will query um, the route and find it for you. And if you are an expert in traffic, you probably know which way you should be going. Um, and so at the end of the day, you, or at the end of your journey, you'll discover what your travel time was, which is essentially the same as travel, uh, uh, discovering what your payoff was. So you can model this as a repeated game in which essentially there is a few um, agents that allocate flow. These agents being Google, being um, uh, 
um, Apple, being NRICS, or being whatever you're using to get your information, TV. Um, and that will result in a distribution of flow. Um, so typically, for each population, if I take a population K going from O to D, that population is distributed along all the possible routes that are technically feasible to go from that origin to the destination. And then at the end of the day, um, in a sense, one can discover what their travel time was. Well, the company, uh, you know, they routed you, so they, 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 they told you a 35 minutes travel time, and then they measured it took actually 41 minutes. They, they, that, that will be stored, and that will be used in the learning algorithm to provide you a routing the next day based on the information gathered. So in a sense, you can view the flow allocation problem at the next iteration, so the next day, to be a function of what it was before, and the experienced latency, or the experienced um, um, travel time at the previous iteration. And then how you do that, the update rule, well, that's how you learn. So the question is, um, how can we model the way learning is done today? And depending on the different assumptions that are made on the learning algorithm, can we say anything about the convergence of that process? And it's not an obvious question, because there are instabilities in traffic. Um, so we'd like to know that it converges to something. And if possible, it'd be good if that something was uh, good for society. It turns out it's going to be a Nash equilibrium, which is not good. Uh, if you could do much better. Um, so in the context of games, it's in a sense, it's basically a repeated game, because uh, you, know, you have a cycle between an environment that provides an outcome from which the agents learn, and that cycle um, happens every day. And all the variations um, can be done in which, uh, for example, you might know about what the other agents are doing, you might not know. In the present case, Google will probably not share with Apple what they're doing for routing, and vice versa. So you can make all kinds of assumptions on the information patterns that are underlying this game. And again, how it relates to your life is really when you uh, launch a router to go from uh, Berkeley to Stanford, for example, usually it'll give you the shortest path, and it'll give you two or three additional shortest path or near shortest path, um, which means essentially, um, uh, if everybody's using that system, everybody should get a shortest path, which means it essentially it's a form of a Nash, or it looks like the solution. It looks like the solution to a Nash game in the sense that if everybody's getting more or less the same travel time. Um, that thing is somehow able to produce a solution to a Nash game. And it's not exactly the case we'll see why, but that's what it looks like. And essentially also what it means is that if you think about the way your mobility is managed today, well, you're using one of these apps most likely, or your car is using one of these, or um, you're using TV, which is also using one of these to, to just read you what they see on the screen. Um, and <clears throat> each of them will probably have a different way to compute the same thing, but as a result, They'll tell you, okay, if you're using Waze, um, you know, Waze will send 30% uh, of their users this way, 8% that way, 62% that way, and then Google will send probably a different percentage one way or another. Okay, so, um, and, and overnight, they will learn, and the next day, this will be improved. So, we want to understand whether that process of allocation of flow along these routes for each of their users um, uh, leads to something which is stable, and then can we characterize anything about the convergence of this process? Right? Just to make sure that I understand, it's probably an obvious point, but when you're saying that they're sending them along three different routes, uh, they're listing the options in a different order, different users, and they enter the same request? We don't know. That's a very good question. The question Alex is asking is, when you get this, um, does everybody get this? If, if all of us now type uh, New York City, so most likely we'll get this between New York City. I don't even know if all of us are getting the shortest path or not. It's it's unclear. They know probably if they have a way to make the sausage, but I don't know that way to make the sausage. And so um, it's unclear. But I think what's pretty clear is that more or less everybody would get um, the three fastest routes, which will be nearly identical within a couple of minutes. But I don't know if they will be presented in the same way. Um, ultimately, it won't be the case, uh, Eva, in a minute, but ultimately, it's going to be more complicated because um, all of these are progressively getting your personal driver preferences. So there's ways already to say, I don't want freeways, or I want freeways, I want a scenic route, I don't want a scenic route, and so on. So the answer is, a couple a couple years ago, definitely not. A couple months ago, definitely not. Now, I don't know, and in the future, probably not. So you know, in the future, people will get different routes, that's obvious, and that's actually where we're going. Uh, yes, Eva? I guess I can ask another version of the same question. 
Um, is this minute estimates the same on all of our phones? Say again? Is the minute estimates of how long does it take to get there? They can just vary those numbers. Show us even the same options, maybe even the same order. Just give different numbers. Like um, estimate it differently as a time. That will make a, a behavioral difference in how people react. Oh, totally. I mean, um, um, and were you saying this because you think that they would use that as a way to suggest different products? Asking. Yeah, no, exactly. Well, I mean, so the question is, should you lie to your customers? Um, and I mean, it is very true. Right now, um, just in the interface they have, the blue route is always supposed to be the shortest. And then on the other ones, you have like two or three minutes longer or similar ETA, which is the official terminology used by Google. Um, but uh, it is true that in the future, um, uh, or even, even now, if you showed people different information, they would behave differently. And in fact, spoofing the latency function is already a way for people to think about congestion pricing. So um, uh, there's going to be a lot of interesting questions about um, what information you display to people. But I do believe that today, most of the companies are basically genuinely sending the shortest path. Because if it ever leaked out that it was not the case, then you would immediately change the product you're using. Um, but it's unclear in the future how that will play. And and in a sense, um, at some point when people start to trade time for money, which will happen with congestion pricing, it's also unclear how that new type of information will show up on these interfaces. So the, so the interest in this problem is essentially understanding, does that process converge to an equilibrium? And we'll see in a minute, it's not always the case. Um, and then potentially say more about the equilibria in terms of robustness uh, in, and in terms of convergence rates. So the first thing to consider is essentially defining a class such that this iterative process converges to a set of equilibria. And in traffic, uh, Nash equilibria are almost never unique. So it's not going to be in equilibrium. It's going to be a set of equilibria. It's going to be called chi star. And then we'd like to understand, is there a class of learning algorithm, UK, such that for that class, you could guarantee that the process will converge. So you can view this as an analysis tool for what's currently happening in, in the field. Um, and so in that context, in that context, specific for routing, the, Nash, the definition of a Nash equilibrium is an equilibrium in which there is no incentive to deviate your path, which means essentially if you are at equilibria, any deviation from the flows that means you deciding not to follow what's told you results in a worst outcome, so you shouldn't deviate your path. Okay, so it's a very um, simple way to characterize a Nash equilibrium, um, which has its counterpart um, in uh, first order optimality uh, conditions. If you have a latency function which is convex, and that's something that we will use in the context of routing later when we use uh, the uh, horizontal potential uh, as a modeling tool for this. So then what I'd like to do is to go at three different levels of depth in terms of the assumptions made on what we think that system behaves like to show that depending on the assumptions you make, whether you make an assumption that the system is a no regret system or whether you do a stronger assumption, which is essentially to say that you could use the replicator dynamics as a way to model a system, or an even stronger assumption is that, that there's an underlying <coughs> complex problem that is used to model this. Uh, to show that depending on what assumption might be a realistic assumption, the guarantees of convergence of that process you have are very different. So the uh, lowest level of assumptions you could make is that uh, this system is a no regret system, which is essentially saying that the regret defined by the way you compare yourself to what would happen if you always played the same and played the best um, is negative. There's no regret. If you make the assumption that the system is no regret with that definition, then the only thing you can guarantee is that the system is converging on average. So that means that if um, the system evolves over time and you keep the average of the outcome, the average will converge to something which is a set of Nash equilibrium. From an optimization standpoint, it's okay because if you use this just as an optimization tool, that's not a problem. But if the system behave that way for real, in a sense it would be very bad news because this is not good for traffic. And let me show why with a very simple example. So say you have um, two origins and two destinations and you solve that routing problem 
Um, and every day you keep doing it and you keep learning this way. Uh, so you can go from two to three by this path, this path, and this path, and you can go from zero to one by this path, this path, and this path. And every day you keep allocating flow, and every day you learn about your outcome. And um, if you just assume that that process um, is no regret, then you can get solutions like this. In essence, um, showing that, well, uh, first iteration, you're going to put a lot of people on that path, the right path. But then because you have a terrible outcome, then the next day you're going to put less. OK, now you're doing great. So everybody wants to do great. So then the next day, uh, they'll put more. And then you'll keep oscillating. Yep. So what's the? No, like there are many standard Neuronet algorithms out there. To get this sort of oscillation, you're using a particular standard algorithm, or um, so it's just no. I, I agree that the sequence is no regret, so in principle it's possible. But I wonder if any standard algorithm would generate such a thing. In fact, I'm, 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 uh, it's, uh, I don't remember which one we use for that one. For the next one that converges, we use the hedge, and that one has such, such strong guarantees that you'll see it, it will uh, kill the oscillation. For that one, I don't remember. It was a, um, I think it was a, uh, I don't even remember actually we allocated the flow. We just checked it was uh, no regret. Um, and, and again, I, I'll have to look back um, at the paper. But the, the, the outcome of the fact that it was no regret was essentially um, this, was, this was, yeah, I, I apologize, I should really know this, so I'll, I'll just look at the end, I, I, I don't remember. Um, okay, um, the, the next one we uh, uh, a multiplicative update, and then with the multiplicative update, as soon as you have uh, that, uh, that, of course, it, it, it's a much stronger class of, uh, uh, of convergence you get, and, and we'll, we'll see that it immediately kills the oscillation. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll look at the paper again, um, uh, what we use for that specific, um, for that specific uh, uh, implementation. So the, the, the point of, of that was just to show that with this uh, update rule, um, in a sense, if we keep taking the average over the oscillations, we essentially um, uh, converge on average, which is, I think, what I'm showing in the next, um, in the next uh, uh, slide. So in a sense, you can see that the latency over each of the um, edges um, uh, stabilizes. Um, but um, of course, in terms of uh, oscillation, it would it would not be satisfactory for the um, uh, from a traffic modeling standpoint. And so that essentially brought the idea of using something much stronger. And so uh, uh, in the approach two, uh, we used uh, multiplicative updates. And of course, now that comes with a lot more uh, guarantees. Uh, so that one resulted um, exactly from uh, the discretization of the replicator dynamics. Um, and so with the proper assumption on the multiplicative updates, uh, we were able to show convergence. Now, there were a few ingredients needed. Um, so the way that algorithm works is um, at every step, you update to the next step uh, by taking your prior distribution and uh, essentially penalizing the ones with bad outcomes. So that would be the latency experience at that step. Uh, by a factor that asymptotically has to go to zero. And so um, with the proper assumption, so the way actually this algorithm is constructed is by discretization of the replicator dynamics. So there is a nice continuous, there's a nice link with um, the uh, continuous uh, system here. And you also have to make some assumptions on the discretization, uh, potentially add some noise and make some assumption on the noise and make also some assumptions on the multiplicative update factor eta t. So it has to go to zero, but it cannot go uh, to zero um, too, um, uh, uh, too quickly. And so here, uh, with that, um, so the notion that it goes to zero, but it cannot be uh, summable, uh, then essentially we're able to show that now it, we have convergence um, uh, almost um, surely to the set of Nash equilibrium. So it's much stronger because now you cannot have these um, uh, oscillations anymore, or at least not in terms of the latency. Um, and so of course, uh, because these oscillations have never really been observed in practice, it's probably uh, a better model. The way the, the proof for that one worked uh, essentially is uh, by looking at the replicator dynamics, showing the convergence on the replicator dynamics, and then by discretization, showing that at each step, uh, you start from a point you end up not too far on the ball from the discretization step, and then taking the limit. Uh, this is an illustration of 
uh, what that would look like in practice. So typically you would have um, uh, discretization steps and um, with the step size getting smaller and smaller closer to the optimum, you have convergence. Um, there is a, a stronger class of complete <coughs> algorithms uh, which have to do with mirror descent in which now you can even quote cheat uh, uh, by the following way. What you would do um, is you would assume that in essence what your model does is a distributed optimization of a complex function not chosen arbitrarily. What you would choose for that is you would choose F to be the Rosenfeld potential which is essentially a uh, complex function from which uh, it has been shown before that any uh, optimal solution is a Nash equilibrium. The, and uh, the beauty is that if you do uh, mirror descent on this system, so at every step um, you observe the latency, so it's no different than looking at uh, the way uh, the uh, uh, system has performed at the previous step and uh, making an update accordingly, so you pick any, uh, any um, uh, member of the, of the subgradient, uh, then uh, at every step um, solve uh, this uh, mirror descent with a regular divergence of uh, a properly chosen function with the same multiplicative update as the one uh, that was used for the hedge algorithms. Um, then uh, you can also show convergence, and then the convergence you get here um, is much stronger. Of course, the benefit of using the Rosenthal potential is that that can be decentralized, uh, so you can uh, split by population, and then there's a lot of results which uh, we use but didn't produce ourselves uh, that uh, enable uh, you to also um, do a stochastic version of this, in which now you are not uh, constrained to um, uh, observe uh, an exact value, but you could have um, a, a value with noise and it would still work. Um, in order to make this work, again, uh, there are assumptions on the learning rates. Uh, they have to diverge and they have to be square solvable and, and a few other uh, technical uh, conditions. But the benefit is that if you make these assumptions, uh, then you can prove convergence. So you have an actual bound on the value of uh, the optimum. Or, but you also have um, a speed of convergence on the state itself. And so um, what's interesting with this is that uh, in a sense, it's no surprise that if you use this assumption on UK, so in a sense, if you're saying that, well, you assume that um, the, each step of the optimization corresponds to um, uh, a step in the descent of the Rosenthal potential, it's, it's not surprising that it would be a better model of traffic because that's, uh, that's a link which has already been shown before in terms of what the solution to the Rosenthal potential is, but it's also interesting that it provides uh, better uh, convergence rates. And specific to the oscillations before, if you take the same, uh, uh, if you take the same network as the one I was um, uh, using before, uh, now you can see that the convergence uh, is, uh, of course, way better, and that there is no more um, uh, uh, oscillations. And so typically, uh, uh, you would also have um, uh, a convergence rate that can be uh, numerically, and I'll show you in the next slide, uh, shown to, to lead to um, asymptotically what the, uh, what the rates are predicted. So in the, um, in the analysis, uh, we had an asymptotic convergence rate, and somehow we can see it uh, happening uh, numerically. So we wanted to see how that would work in practice, and uh, we created a field experiment in order to, to see if we could make, uh, if this could be a good model of the way humans uh, behave. So we created an online game, which we've put on Mechanical Turk, and we're going to try uh, this uh, next month uh, running with a, a large number of people. So far, we run about uh, 10 players. And so the way the game works is, in essence, everybody's playing one router. So uh, uh, 10 students will be chosen, and they'll, each of them have an origin and a destination. Um, and um, uh, at every step of the game, um, they will be uh, asked to allocate flows. Um, given uh, some proportions uh, on each of uh, the different paths that go from the origins to the different destinations. And uh, at, at the end of each iteration, so they'll see how well they did on each of these paths, uh, which is essentially what these screens show. And then based on that, they'll be asked to keep playing to see if that uh, thing converges. So they are shown, the information they're shown is essentially the graph. Um, then they have the control, they can slide um, this so that they can route flows the way they want. And then depending on the setting, they can see um, how well they're doing. 
um, on each of the paths. So each of the paths will show them, okay, the flow you're sending this way is, is not doing well, the flow you're sending that way is better. They can see their cumulative costs and they can see their previous costs. Um, so that's the architecture in uh, which we used to implement it, and it's, it, it's an implementation, in fact, of the previous algorithm, except now it's a game uh, played with, uh, with, the, uh, with the different players. Um, the interesting feature about this is that if you use the um, mirror descent as a model, um, understanding how fast people learn is actually a complex program because the learning rate eta, so trying to um, minimize uh, an error functional encoding uh, the learning rate as an unknown variable, which is the, the variable um, which characterizes how aggressive you are in the, um, uh, in the game, is actually a complex function. So we also used that to try to see if we could learn how people learn. And I mean, if you play that game with 10 different people, it's not obvious that people will learn the same way. And it's not obvious that you know, some people will play more conservatively, some people will play very aggressively. Um, and so uh, uh, at least we're excited when we found out that that problem of learning the learning rate is convex. Um, it's unclear whether it's working very well in practice at this point, but uh, we can forecast one or two steps at least uh, in the way people play. So typically, you know, the way uh, uh, we will see things when we look at what's happening with these games um, is that there's an exploration phase in which people will start to send a lot of flows on the different edges uh, that uh, connect their origin and their destination. And at some point, there will be convergence, and it's all numerical at this point, um, meaning people stop more or less exploring and start to stabilize and have flows which become more steady on the different edges. Um, and so uh, this is something that we've seen experimentally. We need to run the experiments which last longer with more uh, players. But it seems that when we have people play this game, we see a lot of exploration and then things stabilize. And then we see more evidence of, uh, of a convergence. Um, and when we try to see um, if we can forecast what people will do, at this point it's still not working very well in practice and we don't know why. Um, so even though we can technically learn the learning rate of people, um, we have difficulties forecasting what they will play more than one or two steps ahead, and so that's something we don't quite understand um, at this stage. So to summarize this part, um, I think what, what was interesting in, in, in this approach is that we were trying to um, we were trying to see how these repeated game models can be used to uh, model the way um, uh, learning happens over time in these applications that do massive routing. Um, depending on the severity of the assumptions we make, uh, we find behaviors of these models which are more or less satisfying for traffic, obviously that one being the most satisfying. And so far, when we um, try this on people, uh, it seems that these models are uh, behaving decently well. I mean, in a sense, we see people converging to a Nash equilibrium, so it seems to be uh, in agreement with the model. But we need to, sorry, we need to um, do more experiment to see if we can do do a better job at learning um, their learning rates. Um, obviously, ultimately, I think what would be very exciting would be to see if we can get access to some real routing data where we have access to different providers to see if that's something that happens over time because at this point, these are just uh, assumptions. Um, now, the last thing that I wanted to touch base on briefly for the last five, 10 minutes of the talk um, are uh, implication of these concepts on what we see happening on the ground today, because these are things that, that we can measure. Again, going back to this figure where a lot of the different apps are uh, producing uh, splits of flows um, that are different based on the different uh, routing options they show, um, it's interesting to correlate that with uh, what we see in the news and how people perceive these apps. More specifically, in Southern California, there was a lot of uh, interesting news uh, items back uh, a few um, months or years ago when Waze started to become a very famous app um, because people naively assume that Nash is good for society. So if you think about it for a minute, what's happening today is probably worse than Nash in a sense that people, a lot of people nowadays still don't use routing apps, which means people will choose a way to go from their origin to their destination regardless of payoff. 
in people in places you don't know, you wouldn't necessarily think about leaving the freeway, um, or maybe you just don't want to leave the freeway. So um, you might have situations in which today you're worse than Nash in the sense that there is a benefit in deviating. Okay, what you could argue is that probably the apps like the ones I've shown before contribute to steering the system more towards Nash, which we all know. Um, from uh, the price of anarchy is still not as good as an optimal solution. What's interesting in the news is that people completely confused Nash, which is kind of where we're being steered today, with Optimum. So that leads to these kinds of interesting statements about, um, um, you know, that uh, rotting you selfishly is good for society, which obviously we know is not good. And that's not just West Coast, that's also East Coast, just uh, for fairness. Um, what's interesting is that, um, at some point, um, this starts to have implication, and this goes back to conveying that information to people. Um, you probably noticed when you use Uber, I think the majority of the um, drivers of Uber use the same app. They, most of them use Waze. So if you have a lot of people using the same apps, being provided the same route, going back to Alex's question earlier, this has implication on local traffic. Um, these are serious. These are actually um, uh, making people very upset. You can see the titles are getting worse and worse um, until I talked about it in the talk this morning. Basically, uh, what people do is they ask senior citizens in their community to walk along the street with an app pretending their car stuck in traffic. This has happened before. Um, hoping that the algorithm will therefore wrap the traffic around the city. Of course, if the algorithm learns, at some point they'll be detected as spoofers, but um, that's uh, okay. And um, Essentially, at some point, politicians get involved. Okay, so this is now being escalated. Um, and uh, the truth is, when you talk to cities of the size we're talking about here, so you know, talking a city of 50,000 people or 100,000 people along a major corridor, like a two-ton corridor, um, yeah, they'll never take on a big company uh, for running people through their streets because they have four legals, and you know, a company like Google might have 1,000 lawyers. So instead, what they will do is they will build stop signs and street bumps to make traffic worse in their streets so that the app learns not to use their streets. If you think about a way to manage your mobility, it's really poor. Um, but it's, it's in essence um, caused by these apps. And so it's interesting because um, I think that right now what you see in the news and even in the heads of politicians is that um, you know, people assume Nash is good, but it's, it's not the case. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, the right way to do things would be to have apps route uh, people through a social optimum, which they're not doing. Yes, Eva? So there are really two questions here. Uh, I agree with you that the Nash equilibrium is not always socially optimal. Yeah. And obviously, the price I of the yeah. yeah, I don't know if that's the case here. Well, it but is only the case, I'll show you why, but yeah. There is also a social problem. Uh, you know, you don't necessarily have to ruin everyone's neighborhood just because it decreases the travel time. Like, Nash measures travel, uh, social welfare in travel time. Yes. But life has many more aspects. And travel time. So what these guys are complaining is this other aspect, I think. It's not okay to ruin someone's neighborhood. And I think that's orthogonal to whether the Nash is good or bad. It's bad in this other way that's not even getting measured here. Okay, so, I mean, obviously, um, that statement only applies to travel time. And like you said, um, I'm not sure exactly how to, uh, or what to say to, to that question. So, I mean, other than, um, I, think, I, I think the main measure of bad in terms of congestion is currently measured by cities in terms of volume. I mean, travel time is one index, delay is another index, but I think bad is mostly measured by volumes. And um, I think here, uh, Making a statement whether Nash is good or bad is obviously uh, it's not a binary answer, but certainly steering things towards a Nash equilibrium might have negative consequences for local cities, and that's really the, the one statement that can be made cautiously. Um, and I'll show a quick example um, in a minute. Um, and in, in, in essence, what it means is that um, if you're trying to do arbitration between, say, the state which owns the freeways and the local city which owns the city streets the one measure that should be used to make that um, uh, determination is uh, volume uh, rerouting, which I think is one of the major metrics that at least is used for that. But I do agree, okay, it's not, I mean, quality of life and welfare is not just one variable. 
It just happens to be the one that planners um, are concerned about right now. And, and to illustrate that, uh, here's a simple example for Pasadena. So if you just take this three mile stretch of the freeway, um, and if you overnight you assume that say 15%, I'm just like making that number up, um, where suddenly decide to use an app, for example, Waze, and were suddenly given the opportunity to deviate from the 210 corridor and take one of the two arterials here uh, along the freeway in Pasadena, um, then it would reallocate a lot of the VMT um, to Pasadena. And uh, I mean, it, this is what would happen, and this is um, um, the type of, of studies that we're running right now consist exactly in doing this, which is understanding um, at what point the convergence to a Nash equilibrium as a uh, consequence of more and more people using the app um, uh, would happen, and understanding if we can quantify the damage, at least as far as vehicle mice travel, is done on these cities. So you could view this point with a 0% using an app as what was happening 10 years ago. Okay, 10 years ago, if you had no information on routing, um, and you offset that by local traffic, in a sense, nobody would use the uh, arterials, and everybody would more or less stay on the freeway. Um, and then, um, as more and more people are starting to use apps, then what you see is that um, some arterials get congested, 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 and that, that point, that tipping point here, corresponds to the point where um, you have two routes to deviate from the major freeway. So first, um, you'll deviate to that route, say, because that's advantageous, um, and the travel time equals the freeway, and at some point, um, uh, another route will open, because the travel time uh, continues to increase uh, on the arterial routes while it decreases on the freeway. And when you have reached that point, you have three ways to go, uh, and they have all equalized, and, and you have reached a Nash equilibrium. What, what, what it shows is that, you know, uh, that would happen, for example, for this particular example, um, around 17% people using the same app. It's not that far in the future, and it might already be the case in some scenarios. So the type of policy work that is interesting here is that um, I think we're getting closer and closer to be able to model these things. Um, this requires a slight generalization of uh, Nash Stackelberg equilibria because it's actually a bit more complicated than this. There are populations that don't use apps, there are populations that use apps but don't follow apps, and there are populations that use apps and follow apps. So it's still work in progress, but I think that there will be a lot of interesting work to be done in understanding how these different populations can be modeled through um, these equilibria and how Nash equilibria generalize to different populations uh, which behave uh, differently. So um, that's, um, I put the picture of Nash again here because that's an example where we can compute the equilibrium. Um, so I'm gonna uh, stop here. There were a couple other things I wanted to talk about, but we're at the end of the hour. Um, you, we can compute these equilibria, there's algorithms for it. But just to kind of try to wrap this up in a historical perspective. Um, so I think the first phase was really trying to create the information. I think the name of the game a couple years ago, back in 2006, 7, and 8, was um, uh, trying to uh, create that information. That information became available massively around 2010, 2011. Um, and now that we're in the post travel time uh, estimation era, uh, the question is how people are using it. Um, and we see this happening, and we see these um, uh, different models that are being used to characterize the way people learn over time and the way that induces slower time scale dynamics. Um, I think the public policy perspective going for forward in time um, is um, if, there are, if there's going to be other control schemes that are not used right now, and people are really talking about VMT charge in California, how can this be used to provide some arbitration? And for example, if for some reason, going back to this uh, uh, picture here, if we don't want, for some reason, if we don't want uh, a convergence to a Nash equilibria by equalization of the flow, because if for some reason we think it's not fair to the city or it's not um, um, uh, something that is uh, desirable uh, for society, um, well, I think then the question is, could you spoof the latency functions? For example, could you add a monetary component to the latency function, which is essentially a way to do congestion pricing? I think these are very interesting topics in transportation, and I think that uh, uh, there's a lot of good research to be done in the field, and that's one of the things um, that we'll be doing um, in the future. So I think with this, I'm going to stop, and then uh, um, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you.
Is there a communication that goes from the phones back to the companies so that they can use that information to predict what the effect yes. is going to be? Yes. Yes. Um, so specifically, which effect? There's many effects, so that they can predict what effect. So, I mean, in predicting the travel times. Okay. Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the, the, I think the question you're asking is. Um, if I'm Google, if I'm Waze, if I'm Apple, yes. um, I'm going to send 1,000 people from one direct from one point to another. Um, that is going to have an impact on traffic because if I had sent them a different direction, um, they would uh, induce different travel times on different routes. So, if you, you wanted, but to you're have, making a recommendation. You're making a recommendation. Yeah. Yeah. So and you, the, the the question is, do individuals do something on their phone that indicates whether they're yes. Yeah. Yes, John, yeah. and it's worse than that. You do yes. nothing on your phone, and your phone is. No, your phone does it for you. Whether you like it or not. Yeah. When you when you download the app and you click yes, 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 this is when you decide yeah. your phone will do it for you. Okay. So <laughs> now, that, now, now that your phone is doing it for you, the real question is what is done with that information, and that is a very good. That is a very interesting question for the following reason. Okay, um, until very recently. I think it's pretty uh, fair to say that none of the companies who have been in this business solve a dynamic traffic assignment problem. Okay, to solve a dynamic traffic assignment problem, you need good origin destination, you need good demand, and you, could, you need a really good uh, calibrated traffic model. So I'm not aware that that model has existed in the last decade, except maybe very recently in some of these companies. So what that means is that until at least very recently, when, when you have decided to follow what your phone has told you to do, in a sense, you've probably changed the demand of the network. You would not have gone that route, but now you, you are going this route. That information is not, at least until very recently, I don't see how it could have been taken into account in making the travel forecast for you. So the fact that the company is sending an extra 1,000 people on your route, and therefore might make your uh, route worse, was not taken into account by that company. And I'm not saying this to criticize any other company, but I'm just saying this because in order to be able to assess that, the, the extent to which you would need a good model of traffic, of demand, etc., is, is just not been there. Um, so I think things are changing now because I think now, if you think about what you need to produce such a forecast of the impact of what you're asking the amount of people on traffic, I think that it can be done. I genuinely don't know if companies are doing this. Obviously, if I wanted to have good forecast, I should be doing this. Um, and if ultimately these companies are going to really uh, induce drastic changes in congestion patterns, they should be doing it. Um, honestly, there's hundreds of academics who have tried to do that kind of work um, numerically. I mean, the models are there. We know the models. I mean, it's like more or less going to be a version of dynamic traffic assignment. It's more or less going to be a four-step model to produce the demand. And it's more or less going to be a, a way to do forecast. And then you can argue which model is best, which demand is best. But I mean, it's the same game. It's the same, the same sausage is made in a lot of different recipes. Um, but it's, it's just hard. And, and, and um, so that's why I don't believe that this will be uh, done convincingly in the near future just by virtue of the fact that it's a very hard assignment. Yeah, I guess in your big picture with the block diagram where the demand was just one block, right, uh -huh. in the block diagram, I see this modeling of demand in some sense, getting a, a handle on a, an endogenous sub-problem that's, that's being solved by people based on this crowdsource information. But outside of that, there's this whole other layer of you controlling these lights and that light and this light. So now you, you can use this as just a better model for demand. You know, you can, so in some sense, you don't care what people do. Now you're just going to use this as model and develop your control schemes, your your big supervisory things on top of that. Has there been any, have you taken this out to that level at all? Like, um, well, that's what we want to do. Yeah. But I mean, uh, again, I think the problem is the modeling challenges are enormous. For example, right. right now, if you take the area, the geographic area I've shown in Los Angeles, uh, every traffic light will have probably eight timing plans. Okay, which is okay, eight and eight and eight and eight, eight, I mean, this is still a lot of possibilities. But the, these eight timing plans will be mostly um, pre-computed uh, in a way to accommodate very specific historical demand patterns, because that's the way the duties right. have been operating for half a century. Um, so if you can predict that the demand you're observing will lead to these patterns, in a sense, maybe you have a better way to do control, but I think what we're gonna be lost is I think that the routing apps are going to are going to overnight 
potentially generate very much uh, unknown patterns to what are the typical statistics of the corridor for which this infrastructure is not ready. So in a sense, it's a very depressing statement for the infrastructure because you know you could do the best job on the planet in optimal control schemes um, uh, to accommodate that traffic, and unless you have, uh, I would say, demand responsive schemes, which ultimately people will work on, um, you, you, it's not that you're doomed to failure, but it's gonna be just a hard thing to do. Um, so maybe it's a long way of saying it's a very hard job. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so you seem to making the assumption that um, Vays or someone directing a thousand people some way will drastically change the traffic pattern. Oh, yeah. of course. And that clearly would be true if yesterday Vays didn't exist. But the reality is Vays existed yesterday too, and maybe yesterday they sent 999 guys that way, not a thousand of them. Yeah. So what makes you think that the Vays uh, way of routing well, traffic is so unsteady that this causes a problem, uh, well, and not allowing them to just right. use yesterday's traffic as an estimate. Right. So first, let's not use ways. Let's use a generic company because okay. we don't want to be. I mean, everybody is as good or as bad in this field. So, but let's. Okay. Um, <laughs> since you, you, this is recorded for our ways plan, we'll, 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 we'll <laughs> <laughs> it's on the record now. Um, so, um, so okay. Maybe maybe the, the use of the word drastic uh, is, is extreme, because you're right. The adoption rate of, uh, of users is a slow process. Um, I think that I think the drastic things that could happen is we don't really know uh, how people are using the app. These companies know how people use their app. Um, I don't know if the same number of people use the app every day. I don't know in a certain circumstance there is a ball game or the election happened and then it has very specific implications on. The, the way people use apps. So I, I think the first thing to acknowledge is that uh, at least we, if we don't work in these companies, don't have a good way to understand uh, user compliance to the, to the routing. Um, that's the first thing. Now, the, the second thing about scales, a typical lane of a freeway in California carries about 2,000 vehicles an hour at capacity. That's roughly how much you can push today at 65 miles an hour. So 1,000 vehicles an hour using the same routing app on an arterial which has traffic lights that could drastically uh, affect things. And so, in a sense, these effects are not trivial. I mean, um, I understand, it won't happen overnight. I mean, it's not that, you know, now everybody has seen this talk, everybody is going to use their I'm, apps. I'm, maybe, the I'm asking you the question of right. what makes you think that yesterday's right. traffic is not a good estimate. I understand that if overnight a thousand people adopted it, then it would not be a good estimate. Um, well, there's two aspects. First, there is a lot of variability in traffic. I mean, on the same freeway, we see enormous uh, changes uh, from one day to another. Um, if you have a ball game, you'll have 40,000 people, extra people on the road from one day to another. So there are a lot of things. Uh, Fridays are never the same as Thursdays. Uh, so there, there are a lot of, of different factors. That's one aspect. The second aspect is traffic is very nonlinear. So uh, some people have said it's chaotic. Uh, you have to define what you mean by chaotic. But traffic, the, the, the typical traffic models are very nonlinear. So it doesn't need to have a large number of uh, disturbances to create uh, very different traffic patterns. So th that's why um, I don't want to be kind of a, the guy who forecasts disaster and say we need to act on it. But I don't think you need that much input into the traffic system to mess it up. And so in that sense, I agree with you that it's not that uh, everybody's going to wake up tomorrow and want to use Waze and it's going to completely jam a uh, specific uh, area of Los Angeles. At the same time, we see the trends happening. And to me, um, I think that uh, uh, it's only a matter of time become these issues becomes really um, uh, so painful to the local jurisdiction that they just have to do something about it. So I think we'll uh, stop the questions here, and I'll invite anybody who has an additional question to come visit Alex afterwards. But I guess we'd like to thank him one last time. For